Hello everyone and welcome to another ETN Files interview and it's a little bit warm around my neck of the woods so I'm afraid you have to bear with me as I have my little fan going there. I'm your host Joanna Summerscales and my guest today is Martin Northey who joined me all the way over from Dorset to here which is the southeast of England in the UK of course. I wanted to introduce you to Martin because his story may not be the full-on, full-life events of dimensions, abductions and what have you, as in the Bill Brooks story that I uh, co-wrote with him in 2016, but any incidents, any events, any encounters have a profound effect. And also the telling of that story, knowing that you're going to be heard, knowing that you're valued in that, in that retelling, is really important and this is the same for Martin. So whilst Martin's experiences perhaps were more toward the beginning of his, his earlier life, uh, certainly they continue to have an impact and I'm not sure he's still not having experiences now of one kind or another because sometimes we don't always recognize it do we? Anyway I'm going to let Martin uh, get on and share with you something of his incredibly varied and vivid life experiences and some of the incredible events that took him on an amazing journey. So hope you enjoy. And Martin has had some incredible life-changing events and I'm going to let him tell you about those but just to let you know that we're toward the end of August I think it's the 27th and we are Thursday and it's 2020. So Martin I would love you to share with us some of your early experiences of life. Good heavens, yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, do you want to know where I was born? Oh yes, shall we start with that? I started off in Fleet in Hampshire and in 1944, but by 1947-48 I was in North Africa living on a houseboat in Cairo. Sounds very glamorous, I must mm. say. It wasn't that glamorous, <laughs> but anyway, and I can't let you remember it. Okay, and we're going to talk about the memory issue that Martin has experienced in recent years, which was due to a fairly catastrophic event linked with a condition, as I said, he'll explain that, but we'll Come forward first with a few more elements of your life experience. After Cairo, I came back to England aged about three or four. And my father was in the army and as soon as he could, he got out of the army once the war was over and he came to live in England. I went to a series of boarding schools where I was not happy no. at all. In fact, I created mayhem. And were you not happy because you were away from your family? A lot of people have mm, anxiety. I had an idyllic home life, really idyllic. Oh, that's lovely. And I would say that the English public school system is not anything like an idyllic home life. Yeah. In fact, it was bloody awful. I and hated I, it. Was it bullying? Was it what, No, what I wasn't you? bullied. I was too big to be bullied, I think. I wasn't bullied. I just didn't fit into the system. And the system in Britain suggests that you should be terribly enthusiastic about cricket in the summer <laughs> and equally enthusiastic about football and rugby in the winter. And I hated them all. I thought they were absolutely pointless, couldn't see the point. So I didn't fit in. So what was your passion? What was your love? Well, I didn't really have a passion. I was a bit like a ship without a rudder for a long time. But funnily enough, I got involved in photography and developed and printed my own films was fun. Later on at another school I got involved in sailing which I enjoyed very much. I was extremely difficult, I just didn't fit into the system. Well, I was supposed to turn up for cricket matches and football matches or whatever they are and I just didn't turn up which must have been infuriating for the staff. So a little rebel here. A rebel, yes. I used to go off into the woods and walk by myself, perfectly happy but actually unhappy if you see what yes. I mean. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so I didn't fit into the system. So sailing, I think, then became quite a, a strong yes. theme in your life. Well, it did. I, I didn't really realise it because my mother and father weren't into sailing, but I was. They were very much into horses, and so my whole life at home had to do with horses, or ponies initially. Yeah? Yeah. And that was fine, and it was lovely. That's why it was idyllic. 
uh, but I didn't have any of these things at school. I held the record at one school for the amount of times I was beaten in one term. Yeah, I was beaten on a regular basis for various misdemeanors. I got kicked out of one school at the age of 15 for going to the pub. <laughs> And I've done various other things, and I've been warned if I did anything more wrong, I would be asked to leave. So I couldn't wait to find something to do that would help me in that. And I went to the pub, met some friends in the pub, uh, got slightly drunk, and was singing as I walked back down the drive. I think I was singing a song that I learned from someone called Pub With No Beer, which I still know. And so I got thrown out of that school. Yeah. Did your parents have any issue with all of this? Well, I think they were de desperately hurt. They just didn't oh. understand, actually. But I don't know what a psychiatrist would say about it now, but I wasn't happy and I wasn't motivated in any way at all. Yeah. So the sailing motivated you? Was that your first? Yes, that was fun, but we only did it once a week, so we had to go through the rest of the week. <laughs> so where did you find yourself then with your I, interest in sailing and then what yeah. was your week filled with? It took me a long time to find myself, I think. I went off at the age of about 18 to Australia. I bought a car when I got there, obviously a very second-hand car, a Ford Anglia, and I drove that car right round Australia and had a total of 27 different jobs, which was great, you could in those days. I was only 18 when I arrived in Australia, £10 POM, and for £10 you could immigrate to Australia and you had to stay there for two years, and I stayed there for three years and three months, and I loved it, I had a wonderful time saw a lot and had 27 different jobs and that was a wonderful experience. And yeah. when you came back to the UK, what happened? Well, I felt, some, again, when I got back slightly like a square peg in a round hole, yeah. I came back with a very strong Australian accent, which is not there anymore. I've lost it, obviously, a long time ago, but I sounded like a one-man flying doctor service for a long time. <laughs> And uh, again, I didn't really fit in at all. Things had been done very differently in Australia and uh, attitudes were totally different and I didn't really fit in. I went off to Germany and I lived in Germany and I became an encyclopedia salesman. I wasn't a very good salesman, but I was quite a good manager. I was promoted to being a manager and I had people working for me. And we drove around and, and sold encyclopedia to American servicemen and their families. And that was fun. Uh, and I did that for, I don't know, about four years or so, reasonably successfully. Eventually I came back to the UK and I'd been encouraged by my wonderful father to get a proper job for some time. And I got a job at the Reader's Digest. I didn't really fit in there. It was okay. I think I lasted for about four months or something. Then I left and went back to living in Germany again. Were you learning languages as you went along? No, I'm hopeless at languages. <laughs> yeah. You seem to do very well though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. Look, I know you've been a blacksmith and I know you've been a top no. guy on oh, sailing no. yeah. as a master teacher. Well, yes, I, I love blacksmithing and I did that for a total of 10 years. I did some training with COSIRA, the Council of Small Industries in Rural Areas. Okay. So I did more or less know what I was doing and I enjoyed it very much. But I had a forge which I created myself out of an old barn. And that got burnt down in a fire, sadly. And that put me completely out of business, which is probably the best thing that has ever happened to me. Because I was smoking like a chimney and trying to give up smoking. I tried everything. I tried acupuncture, I tried hypnosis, and none of this really worked. But the fire did the trick. <laughs> what was it about the fire? That may sound a long question. fire put me out of business, I had no income. Hmm? Oh. Okay, <laughs> no. so no money to buy cigarettes yeah, then. That's right. <laughs> but oh, I bought a boat with two years smoking money in advance. Really? Yeah. That's yeah. impressive, gosh. Yeah. Well, it wasn't an expensive boat, you know. <laughs> but a dinghy. It was a big, a big dinghy, and that got me into it. And I did a theory training course, day skipper training course, which I passed. Probably one of the few things I've ever passed. Now I enjoyed it very much. And I went on from there and got a slightly bigger boat, 
uh, got another qualification or two, and after a few years, I had become an examiner for the Royal Yachting Association. Oh, how fantastic. Which, yeah, I did that for about 20 years. So yeah. then where were you based during that time? I was based, first of all, in Poole. Yeah. In Dorset. In that's... Dorset, yeah. And then I went to live in Portugal. When I was based in Poole, I used to sail down to Portugal and on and on to Gibraltar. Yeah. I ran my sailing school on my own boat from Gibraltar. So I got to know that area quite well and eventually decided that I would base myself in Portugal. And that's where I was for years. And I worked as an examiner for the RYA and as a yacht master instructor. And I taught people sailing. And then I moved over to what we call the dark side. And I started to teach people how to drive motorboats, having learned myself how to do it. Mm. Yeah, well, of course. Mm. <laughs> it's rather important. And I enjoyed that very much. Also, the people who have motorboats have got more money than the people who've got yachts. Or at least they don't mind spending it. Yeah, that's the important thing. So I can charge quite a lot of money uh, for my services. Yeah, and I worked as that for yeah. years. Fantastic. And that brings me on to how I became very, very ill. Yeah, and I suddenly started collapsing all over the place and being picked up by ambulance here and there and having no recollection of having collapsed and wondering oh, really? how the hell I got there. I collapsed at one point while driving my car at about 70 miles an hour, left the road and hit a tree. A friend of mine who is a policeman and was a policeman then said that uh, very few people survived that, Martin. <laughs> I was slightly bruised from my safety belt, but that was all. Had a hell of a job getting out of the car because it was on its side and so on. Anyway, I wasn't hurt. It did begin to alert me to the fact that there was something wrong. Yeah. And I saw a lot of doctors, no one knew what was wrong. And eventually it was discovered by one of my clients who I was teaching to drive his catamaran that I had hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is something we've all heard about, perhaps, that babies get and their heads yes. get swollen. My head wasn't getting swollen. So there's a huge lot of pressure though building so up. a lot of pressure, yeah. yeah. Wow. And this was why I was collapsing. Yeah. Nothing has happened in my life by accident. And he is a neurosurgeon and he knew precisely what was wrong with me by my gait, he said. At the time we were walking down to the Hagen Dars ice cream shop to buy an ice cream. So were you aware of how you were walking, how your yes, body was Yes, yes, I'd become very concerned that my walk had got very slow and I joined a walking club to try and resolve this, it yeah. didn't really resolve it. And I couldn't resolve it by walking because the problem was just here in my brain. And my client who was a surgeon operated on me in his clinic in Switzerland and fitted a shunt, which worked beautifully and I got much better for a few months. I mean, did all symptoms disappear then? Yes, they did. Wow, yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, they did. And a few months later, I started to get worse again. It was very strange. No one knew what the hell was wrong with me. Oh, and I was got, I got so bad, I had to move into a care home. I couldn't walk. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I could walk with a stick and moving from my bed to my armchair was an adventure every time. <laughs> my goodness. So, yes, I, was, I moved into a care home in Portugal. My sister persuaded me to fly to England with a friend acting as a carer. And I moved into a care home in England, uh, in Swanage, a very nice one. They looked after me beautifully, um, uh, thanks to the guidance of my sister, mainly. Also, my daughter and my son was very helpful. I went to the neuro department of Southampton Hospital, which I think has a very good reputation. Mm -hmm. And I'm not surprised because they found out what was wrong with me. But they eventually removed my shunt and discovered that I had an infection in my brain and told me that they couldn't do anything for six months when, oh, and they got rid of the infection with antibiotics by injecting antibiotics into my brain. They couldn't do anything for six months when they would fit, if I wanted it, a new shunt. And a shunt would control the level of cerebral fluid that was causing the problem. And it seemed to be, as I understand it, as Martin explained earlier, that the reason for the hydrocephalus is that the fluid had was not draining down. That's right. And I might just say at this point that Martin also has told me that 
he fractured his neck a couple of times. I mean, what he survived is amazing. So I'm just wondering also um, if that fracture didn't cause some impediment in the flow, but also there may be an ET element to this, but we'll come to that in a minute. Mm. So no, yes. I don't think fracturing my neck really caused any problems apart from fracturing it. <laughs> If you see what I mean. Okay. And all, all, all I did was, was fall off a horse on two occasions. And if you fall off a horse, you usually hurt yourself. Yes, mm. but fracturing your neck is a pretty yes. delicate yeah. area. Yeah. But anyway, I, okay. I don't want to digress. Well, maybe you're right about that, I don't know. Where did we get to? So you were in Swanage and you were going to have oh, a yes. shirt so, if they wanted to. Yeah, it. yeah. And I was in my care home in Swanage, uh, perfectly happy. I had suffered uh, loss of memory and I, I have learned since that the memory or the recent memory part of the brain is just there where oh, the right. shunt was fitted. And so, and I also suffered from many of the symptoms of dementia. So I had a lot of, in common with the other people in the care home. And I was perfectly happy. But anyway, the surgeon kindly fitted after six months a new shunt which controlled the flow of liquid. Yeah. And within three days I could walk again, which was incredible. Yeah, within three days I could walk again. Um, and what about the cognitive functioning? Was that- That also... got better, that got better, but that's taken longer. Yeah. That's taken longer. I mean, you sound amazing, and Martin's been here with me, uh, uh, we've been spending some time together the last couple of days, and I have to tell you, uh, fantastic. I, I don't see any cognitive impairment from just uh, in the discussions so you know mm -hmm. and I and I have uh, you know interviewed people before who have had that th through other reasons and so mm -hmm. you know it's interesting and also what people come into experience I think that is fascinating and also the testament to the human spirit and also the life that you've chosen mm -hmm. to incarnate in at this time to share this incredible story because not many people can come back from the care home scenario and you wouldn't have been that old in, being in a care home. You wouldn't have been 70 then, would you? Or would yes, you I, 70? I'm 76 now and I went but, in there four so, years ago. Yeah. But, but still not, not, not that old. Not you, that you old, know, no. Mm. You know, 70 is a new 50, isn't it? That's right, yeah. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Mm. So just moving forward then, so you spent, were you a couple of years in the care home? I was 21 months in the okay. care home, yeah. Yeah, I started to feel better not long after the new shunt had been fitted yeah. and I was keen to get out of the care home because it was costing me yeah, I think 750 quid a week which was a fortune it to absolutely me. absolutely is and you know if you don't I'd, have that. I'd well. sold my house in, in Portugal in order to pay for this yeah. and anyway I was keen to get out and I was keen to work again I'd always worked and so I actually asked them if they would give me a job the care home. Uh, care home, yeah. yeah, well, yeah. And amazing. the activities lady there, who was wonderful, she got me going again. She was very keen to have me as her assistant, which would have been fun. Anyway, the manager expressed an interest in giving me a job, but then when she asked the owners, they said no, because it's against the rules to employ someone who's previously been a resident. I mean, what kind of logic behind that is, I'm sure I don't I'm not, know. I but... don't know. <laughs> But anyway, you know, so, what, what a wonderful gift that Martin yeah. has with his understanding of A, being right at the coalface of the experience mm -hmm. for himself and the fantastic empathy that he has to mm -hmm. share with others and support mm -hmm. them in, mm -hmm. in their experiences of this scenario. Well, anyway, I was keen to do some work. I've been helping in the care home because I had nothing else to do, mainly taking other residents to the loo. Whilst you were a resident yourself? Whilst I was a resident. I wasn't allowed to push the ones that were in wheelchairs, but I could hold them by the elbow and guide them to the loo and then bring them back again, having waited outside. That was, I think, quite appreciated. It was certainly appreciated by the residents. Yeah. And well, guys, you, you know, we, we, we mm. all know, and, you know, this is back to, you know, human basics. And I have a sister with a disability, a severe disability, and, you know, not being able to go to the toilet yourself or at all. You know, it's a fundamental process of being a human and you take it for granted a lot. So I just am flagging this up because Martin was a resident and he was then offering to help um, these people. And I think that is fantastic. And this kindness and compassion is a signature 
of him. And I think we should uh, just take a leaf out of his book. But anyway, we'll continue. So, so I enjoyed helping and it was very rewarding. Anyway, they, they decided they couldn't give me a job and, and I, I'd given, or my daughter who was in charge of me, I wasn't even in charge of myself. And I gave a month's notice and I was leaving. I bought a caravan which my daughter's husband had parked outside where she was living and uh, I was going to move into my caravan which was disapproved of by some members of my family because it was thought that I couldn't take care of myself but with a great deal of help from my daughter I moved into my caravan and I was fine and since then I bought a flat in Dorchester where I'm very happy but anyway I did get a job in a care home there are many care homes in Swanage and I googled care homes in Swanage and I came up with one and I telephoned and said, are you looking for anyone? Can I have a job? And I was told to go up and I was interviewed and I was asked if I could dance and sing. <laughs> and I said, no, I can't do either. <laughs> but I don't mind looking stupid. <laughs> so about two weeks later, after various checks had been made, for instance, that I didn't have a police record and stuff like that, I ended up at work in this car home. That was two years ago, almost exactly, and I'm still working now. From our discussions, I know that he does a lot of end of life support and care, just because that's what goes on a lot at these homes, that this is the experience that people have. Often Martin is there as the support and the kind, compassionate voice and holding of hand person. So. Thank you on behalf of humanity for doing that. I think that's beautiful. Well, I find it very rewarding. I was a bit shocked when I was asked to do that before I even started work. I was told that this would be something I would have to do. But I find that I've just sort of slipped into it. And it's nice to know that I can be with people. At what for some people, I'm told, can be a very difficult time. Yeah. And um, for the ones that I've experienced, most people just slip away in the night when I'm not there and I hear in the morning that they've gone. But some have done it. One lady recently, who I was very fond of, who was 103, I was asked if I would go and help her with her lunch. And so I did it, not something I normally did with her. And I sat with her holding her hand and she didn't seem very interested in eating her lunch. I have a tendency if I sit for too long to go to sleep and I went to sleep and when I woke up I was woken up by a carer coming in to move my lady from her chair to her bed and she said Martin I think she's gone. Oh what a lovely way to go having your hand held by somebody as kind as well, Martin. Well I was still holding her hand after she'd gone oh. but uh, I'm very pleased that I was able to be there. Mm. Yeah, mm. that's wonderful. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing that. And now mm. we're going to go to part two <laughs> and hear about the ET stuff. Arriving in Australia. I arrived at Fremantle in Western Australia on January the 6th, 1963 as a passenger on an immigrant ship, having sailed from Southampton. I was what became known as a 10 pound POM. Why? Because having surrendered my passport to the Australian government, they gave me an assisted passage to Australia on the understanding that I stayed there for two years. In fact, I stayed for over three. Wearing a white tropical suit that had belonged to my father, I stepped out into the sunshine with blood down the front of my jacket that I had got from my own nose, having got into an altercation with a rather large Glaswegian the evening before. He had been upset by the fact that he had found me in a young lady's cabin whom he had looked upon as being his property. So the adventures begin. I had no planned destination but instead just drove north through New South Wales for about 23 hours until I got to Didcot in Queensland, a total distance of 973 miles. I found a hotel where over a glass of beer, I discussed with the landlord the possibility of my finding work in the area. He suggested that I go and see a local farmer called Percy Trigger about 20 minutes drive away 
he'd heard that Percy was looking for someone. Percy was a wonderful man. He was 82 years old and still rode his old mare out into the bush every day. His old mare was actually four years old, 15 hands high, and shod only on her front feet, which Percy did himself. The farm was a dairy farm, and we milked about 60 cows in a milking parlour. Our daily routine would be to get up at 5 a.m. to milk the cows, and the milking parlour was powered by electricity from a single cylinder petrol engine powering a generator. Percy had a housekeeper who had a son the same age as me, who I got on well with. I quickly gained enormous respect for Percy. He had started his working life with a team of horses and hired himself out doing work on farms. After breakfast, my job was to go out into the bush on a horse and find any cows that had calved and bring them and their calves slowly back to the farm buildings. We would often see brumbies out in the bush. These are wild horses that have escaped from captivity and bred on their own. Usually, they're about 15 hands high. Percy told me that normally he would get one of the Aborigines living on the farm to break them in, but wondered if I would like to do it, as I had been riding since I was about five years old. I thought it would be fun to break in some horses with Percy as my teacher, and so agreed to do this without any hesitation. I had 27 different jobs as a part of my travels. One of those jobs was at Port Augusta, where I got a job as a bulldozer's driver's mate, making an enormous reservoir. My job was to stand on the blade with a crowbar and dislodge any rocks that got stuck under the blade. Health and safety didn't exist in any form then. The dozer was a Caterpillar D9. And welcome back to the ET Newsroom. And I am with Martin Northey, who joins me in the St. Leonard's area, all the way from Dorchester in Dorset. We're going to talk about his extraterrestrial, alien, ET, other beings, other intelligences, experiences. At the age of 12, I was introduced to these related subjects by my godmother. So I accepted the existence of extraterrestrials, flying saucers. I believed in reincarnation. But as a teenager, I started having some very strange experiences. A little later than that, perhaps in my early teens, I didn't connect to anything extraterrestrial. What started to happen was lying in bed, the atmosphere around me would change in its consistency and it would become thicker. That makes sense. Yes, yeah. and was there any feeling to it? Yes, there was. There was a static electricity to it that was almost crackling. In fact, it was crackling. And I couldn't understand it and I didn't like it and I found it frightening. And eventually it would go away because I went to sleep. But I would fervently wish that it would go away. And how often did that happen? Was it a common occurrence? Quite, quite a common thing. I can't tell you how often it happened. Maybe it happened 10 times, maybe it happened 20 times. But I didn't like it. I didn't talk to anyone about it because I couldn't describe it. I just didn't have the vocabulary to describe it. Did you have any idea what that might maybe related to? No, I didn't. I didn't know what it was. But at around that time, I had a dream that I was taken in a flying saucer. And it was a very vivid dream. The people in the flying saucer, they weren't sort of little green men with big ears or anything. They were perfectly normal people. And they were not intimidating. And I liked them. They took me on a trip across country, which was thrilling. I'd always enjoyed speed. And I enjoyed it. The extraordinary thing was I could see through the floor, which seemed very strange. I have heard of that before. Well, I've read about it or heard about it on the internet. However, I didn't read about it at the time. And that's what made me think that it must be a dream because you can't see through the floor of 
any flying vehicle. And so I thought it was a dream. Later, I began to realize that perhaps it wasn't a dream. And I also began to realize that this strange feeling that quite often happened to me prior to going to sleep was connected to that dream in some way. Can you just describe for us the people who took you on this wonderful trip? I can't trip? remember what they looked like, except that they were European, I think with fair hair, and they were very friendly, and I wasn't intimidated by them in any way at all. And did you undergo any procedures or any training? Well, or I have since call? thought that I probably did. But I have no recollection of any procedure. But I'm sure, I mean, they were nice enough to give me a good time, so I enjoyed that. I don't know what they were doing. They may have operated on me in some way. I don't know. I don't know if they were stealing my DNA, which I've heard can happen, or what. I don't know. Or perhaps stealing my seamen in order to help one of their lot give birth. I don't know. So did those experiences continue through into your adult life? I think it stopped in my teenage years. I went to Australia, as I mentioned earlier, at the age of 18. It might have happened once or twice in Australia. I'm not sure. I can't remember. And so as you have got into your middle years, was there any interaction then? or None whatsoever. So it was just that window when you were early teens. That's right. Do you have any feeling about what that might have been related to? No, I have no idea. And I have no recollection of any conversation that I had with these people. And when you were on the craft in your lucid dream and you were looking through the floor and seeing the country pass beneath you, was it just over Earth or did you go further afield? I don't know. I, I, I don't remember. It was just a, a thrilling, fun experience and I enjoyed it. As any, was I about 16 or 17 year old would. And do you think that there may have been anything related to your brain issue, your encephalus? Well, I'm slightly suspicious of that, yes, because I've done an awful lot of research using the internet and buying and reading books. And I've learned quite a lot. And that was how I met you, Joanne, because I uh, spotted something about you on the internet. And I have read that our recent memory is contained just there. That is where my shunt is fitted. And that is where the problem of hydrocephalus existed. And I wonder if the ETs zapped me on a regular basis just there so that I wouldn't remember my experience with them and perhaps did some sort of permanent long-term damage. And that's what I think, unintentionally. And uh, that's what gave me my problem of hydrocephalus. Because you had, a, of course, an interest in this. And I know you said that even with that uh, experience, you didn't feel able to speak to anybody else about it, but you did feel that it was a relief to speak to someone. Speaking to you about it was the most enormous relief of my entire life. It really was, because I've been searching the internet unsuccessfully for ages for someone to talk to about it. I thought there must be some sort of an organisation to help people who had been abducted, because by now I realised that I had been abducted, although I had no memory of the abduction. And I was searching for some sort of an organization so I could share the experiences that I'd had with other people. And I found it through you, which is wonderful. And that has been a great relief. And it has convinced me that as there are so many other people that this has happened to, that I'm not kidding myself. This really happened to me. It really did. And I don't know why, and I would like to find out. And I think a lot of people feel that way too. Mm. I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to add to that, how you feel that may have impacted your life, opened your mind up, perhaps? To... Well, yes, I, I think some changes have been made. I am not quite the same person that I was before I became ill. OK, I was quite a good sailing instructor and motor cruising instructor and so on, but those are my only interests in life. It really never occurred to me that I would want to help people who were merely suffering from old age and dementia. 
and my illness gave me many of the symptoms of dementia. So I've experienced them and I know exactly what they're going through. And that qualified me for my job. Now, is that an accident? I don't think so. I'm a great believer in synchronicity and there has been and still is on an almost daily basis an enormous amount of synchronicity in my life. And so none of these things happen by accident. I also believe that I have a guardian angel. Now, if my guardian angel is one of those people on the flying saucer, I don't know. And what is it you told me about feathers? Oh, I'm constantly finding white feathers in my flat. Yeah, I mean, perhaps I've got a pillowcase that's leaking, I don't know. <laughs> but I often find them, yes. Well, I definitely have an angel who looks after me. There I think you absolutely have. absolutely no doubt, because I have got away, not literally with murder, but I've been extremely lucky <laughs> in my life, rescued from all sorts of things. And there's definitely someone who is looking after me, and for which I have an enormous amount of gratitude. And would you say that these many experiences have had an impact on you as a spiritual being as well? Yes, I do have spiritual beliefs. I believe in a higher power. It's a bigger thing than that, though, because my God isn't a he or a she, and it isn't an it either. It's the power of good. And someone once said to me, God doesn't have hands, he has people. And it is the people in my life who have helped me enormously. And those are God's hands, if you like. So I do have religious beliefs. I don't go to church. I do understand that when we die, we go into a different vibration that is just as solid as this one is here. But it's a different one, and I accept that. And with my old people at work, I often talk to them about this. I'm probably not supposed to, but I do. <laughs> well, I'm very glad you do. Yeah, and they, I think they find it, they are interested and they find it helpful. Hmm? Well, it's a great comfort. Yeah, they find it comforting, I think, yes. So I do have religious beliefs. I go to church as a part of my job, or I did before this bloody virus came, and I take residents to church, which I actually enjoy, and they enjoy it, they love it. It can be very funny. We have some very nice vicars, some of them ladies, some of them men. And I have told them that I actually don't believe in the traditional church views. I believe in the views that were held by Christians in the first three or 400 years of Christianity, not as changed by the Romans. They don't approve of my views, but they've been quite nice about it. The rebel rises again. Yes, yes. I told them I believe in reincarnation, which of course the church doesn't officially believe in anymore, but they did for the first few hundred years. Yes. This is what's so extraordinary. And I find it very helpful in my life. And I'm definitely given a guiding hand on a regular basis. I ride a motorbike, which I enjoy. I ride 28 miles a day to and from work. When it's a nice day, I feel an enormous amount of gratitude for the amount that I'm enjoying myself. When I feel this gratitude, I often feel a very gentle push of confirmation on my back. How beautiful. Mm. Update from Martin, 18th of June, 2021. I thought I would write and tell you that I had a big fright yesterday evening when a man, about six foot six tall, suddenly appeared. He was there for only about half a second he was standing in front of my curtains and where I have a glass top table. He didn't come in through the door or window. He just materialized and then dematerialized as if he'd come in from another dimension. I can't describe his face because he just wasn't there for long enough. I have been hoping to get in touch with the ETs that abducted me. So Martin, maybe you're getting a little bit of what you wished for. And I think that is an absolutely lovely note on which to say thank you very much.
Martin Northey from Rochester. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> this is ETN, the ET Newsroom, over and out.